Shimai. Today we are having a little walk along the lane um, past wood by here and it feels like summer has finally come to an end and autumn has sort of started to kick in. And behind me is this wood um, and it's really interesting because along the hedge to this wood here there's a huge sort of diversity and, and variation in, in the plants coming through. I mean we've got everything from spindle by here that we've looked at previously to um, field maple by there, uh, we've got hazel in there, um, another hazel by here, but actually the real star of the show at this time of year is this here. And this is a type of wild rose and we've got two sort of common wild roses in Britain. We've got um, the dog rose which is cana, uh, sorry rosa canina and we've also got field ro rose which is rosa arvensis uh, and in Welsh there rossin key which is dog rose or rossin gwyllt um, and they're really common. I mean they, they appear in hedgerows and the edges of woodlands like this and in scrubland um, and they're this kind of thorny you can see it here, arching shrub um, that scrambles through the hedges and, and actually if you look up there can grow really quite high as well uh, and it can get to sort of well as you can see up there it can get to about well, be, anywhere between sort of one and four meters tall and and that's as it sort of scrambles up there and, and climbs higher I guess for for light as most of the plants will do uh, and we're going to get a closer look at this now when most people think of roses, they all obviously go for the flower first um, and especially the domesticated roses that most people have in their gardens. Um, now, the dog rose, as we said, uh, it flowers slightly differently to the, to the field rose. Now, the dog rose flowers um, are sort of a pink with, um, uh, well, pink and white, but generally it's tinged. Sometimes they can be whitish, but they are definitely tinged with this pinkish colour. Um, and then the, uh, the field rose, um, the flowers are always white. I mean, that's the main way you can tell the difference. Um, and you'd think that we would be looking at it whilst it's in flower, but actually this splash of red when autumn and, and winter starts to come it really brightens up the sort of uh, the dullness I guess of, of the colours through the winter um, and the flowers that, that we've obviously missed now they, they appear between May and August um, and they're usually sort of anywhere the petals are anywhere between sort of 15 to 25 millimetres long and the flowers are between sort of four to five centimetres across so they're not massive flowers um, and like we said they, they're either sort of pink and white or, or just white uh, and they will either grow solitary or in groups small groups of three to four flowers together um, and although the, the, the scent fades quite quickly, they are quite sweet scented if you get up to, to smell them. They have five petals. Now, the leaves, as we can see here, are quite sort of distinctive. They've got quite a, 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 well, it's a small serration along the edge. And there's about anywhere between sort of five to seven leaflets, as you can see. There's one, two, three, four, five, and two little ones at the base there making it seven but like I said it's these fruit that really make it so special at this time of year and you can see them there now the fruit can be anywhere between sort of 10 to um, 20 millimeters long and they're this ovoid shape now um, the dog rose which this one actually is is uh, the one with the pinkish white flowers and the 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 fruits, the hips that they're called, are this oval pointed shape. Now the field rows, the hips are smaller and more rounded. Oh hello. And there's something else that's quite important to, to speak about before we go any further, is the stem, because as with roses, it has really strong downward curved thorns. And for anybody who's worked outside or gardened or um, as I have laid hedges and things, this can really scratch you to bits it'll drag into your clothes it'll hook into your skin so you've got to be really careful around around roses like this um, but back to these back to these fruits back to the, the hips that they're called um, you can see they are bright shiny red beautiful to look at um, but inside of there is a seed um, because this here the fruit on the outside the seed is actually contained inside of there and the seed can be quite irritating because it's covered in lots of tiny little hairs um, so you've got to be quite careful with these um, 
because of the, the irritation caused by those hairs. Apart from being um, a, a really lovely plant to look at, like I say, when this is in flower, it's lovely, but this time of year with these red berries, it, it really, is, um, really is quite special. Uh, but it's these hips that are quite useful because these are, um, normally we would steer clear of red things. We we're always warned that, you know, red is, uh, is a sign of danger, but actually these are, um, they, they are edible and they can be used for lots of different things. So rose hips, these, these fruit, that we can see here. I mean, they've been used for making jam and juice and tea and soup. Um, and the rosehip tea actually was used uh, as an aid to recover from colds and, and fever because it's rich in vitamin C. Now this sort of high level of vitamin C that's in it made it absolutely invaluable during the war um, period because it was, um, it was given to children as a sort of rose hip syrup uh, as a substitute for vitamin C because children weren't getting uh, you know oranges and, and, and fruit like that that provided the vitamin C and during sort of um, during the wartime well from the sort of 1930s onwards uh, these were collected in, in sort of vast numbers I mean by 1945 450 tons of rose hips or thereabouts were gathered to make the syrup um, and people were actually uh, paid to collect so children sort of would would go out and collect these rose hips specifically for that purpose and, and get paid for for their trouble I guess the flowers are also use, um, useful and they can be eaten the petals can be eaten and but you can imagine they, they're not very big and, and I mean what I've read is that they're useful for sort of sprinkling on a salad perhaps um, but rose water is, is apparently very good for tired eyes and the root so the rose root which um, if we sort of track down that stem there to the base the root was thought to be a cure for rabies uh, in the olden days uh, which is one of the one of the sort of possibilities of where the name dog rose came came about. Some of the other possibilities for where the name dog rose came from um, was because back at the time of Pliny the Elder, he'd written about um, England, um, which was known as Albion, because there was so much, he claimed that there was so much of, of this rose about with its sort of whitish flowers um, that it, it was a, a sort of, it became like a derogatory term, so meaning that um, it was described as a dog, as a bad thing, because this, uh, this rose was so common throughout Britain but actually it's also thought that the name might have come from the Anglo-Saxon term uh, meaning dagger from the th either possibly from the thorns which as you can see is sort of like a dagger or even because the, the stems of these sometimes grow bigger and thick enough um, and we can't quite see the base of this one down there, that the handle um, of a dagger could be made out of the, the rose stem. As you can imagine, any, um, any of these wild plants like this that produce a lot of flowers or fruits like this are great for, for the wildlife. Um, when this is in flower, it'll be visited by loads of pollinators visiting those flowers. And then obviously once these hips, once these fruit uh, start to form, they're a great food source for birds like blackbirds and also um, they're a good food source for voles as well. But the most interesting thing with, uh, with these wild roses, and actually I have had a good look and I cannot find one, is that they'll be visited by gall wasps. Now the wasp will lay its egg in the, the flower and it prevents these rose hips like this from developing and actually what it does it creates this sort of crazy growth and you'll end up with like a, a red um, a cluster of like hairs it's, it's almost like I mean I can't think of any other way to describe it other than like a fuzzy red ball um, and it's because it's it's visited um, by, by this gall wasp and it's the, uh, the Robin's pincushion gall uh, which is the Diplolepsis uh, rosea um, and the wasp, like I say, creates these sort of, um, creates these galls and, and they're fascinating to see. And I, I'm just really disappointed that there's not one on here for me to be able to, to show you. But well worth having a look for. As you would imagine with anything like this, there's, there's law and myths surrounding it. Uh, we always associate roses with um, love and beauty, but in Germany it's, um, it's linked to the devil um, and its fruits were said 
to be used by fairies to make them invisible and that's not the nice little dancing fairies those are those mischievous fairies but actually for us it's generally um, considered a sign of love and of beauty um, but it's also been historically considered um, a symbol of silence of um, secrecy and actually in old buildings when they used to have beautiful sort of um, plaster uh, um, shapes on the roof you know uh, sort of um, how do I describe it? You know, uh, there's, pro there's, a, there's a proper word for it. I can't think what it is. But they would put these plaster mouldings up on the roof and in the centre of the room they would put a rose. And that was a symbol that um, it was to remind the people in the room that, that the conversation should in that room should not be repeated. And actually, um, in 1526, uh, the symbol of the rose was placed over confessional boxes as this idea that whatever goes on in here is a secret and um, shouldn't be repeated. So there we go. Um, the wild rose, whether it's the dog rose or the field rose, like I say, there's very little to, to distinguish between them, it, whether it's down to the, the shapes of the, the hips like that, or whether it's the colour of those flowers. But you'll definitely know when you found a, a, a rose because of those spiky, spiky thorns that can get you. And it is a great time now to, to find them, especially with these beautiful red um, rose hips on them. So there we go, the wild rose, a great time to go out and find it. So good luck. <laughs>